this book and think, by the way, Mr. Bond, you too are in the book, not as a ghost, mm -hmm. but as a chronicler of ghosts, of Firangi <laughs> Bhuts, in fact. Uh, that section I owe a lot to you, sir. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for putting me in the book. Um, and I, I guess that's why in, in uh, former times, the, the, the mad dogs and the subs wore solar topies. Maybe it helped. Uh, and I've noticed nobody ever has been, I haven't seen anyone in a solar topi for the last 50 years, I think. Huh? So I don't think they protected you from the sun or anything else. Huh? Um, maybe from stones being thrown at you and they've probably bounced off, hmm, off, the, off the solar topi. Hmm. But yes, seeing, uh, I, I've never seen a ghost in, at midday, but then I think I'm in your book by default because I've never seen a ghost at all. <laughs> I, I, I have simply write ghost stories. Um, a, well, we'll get to those then, ghost stories. But yeah, I was thinking, uh, I actually looked in the book to see if there were any ghosts that related to the Victoria Memorial, because that seemed like a good place where some ghosts could hang out. Unfortunately, we haven't found any, though I, you know, maybe you should ask the director of the Victoria Memorial, Mr. Joyanto Shengupto, who is around, whether he knows of any ghosts that can be added in a later edition of the book. But it so happens that we are sitting right at the feet of one of the ghosts who do, does make it into this book, and that is Warren Hastings. Uh, Warren Hastings' ghost is still hanging around our city. And could you tell us what he's looking for? Yeah, so I guess the history of this fellow is that he got in a lot of financial trouble. He was uh, accused of corruption many times, and then he executed the guy who uh, accused him of corruption. And uh, he was constantly having legal battles over raiding the treasury and this, that. Um, and finally, he went back to England and died in England, I think. Uh, but nevertheless, even though he, his grave is there, he is said to appear from time to time in front of the Hastings House, which is now the Institute of Education for Women, uh, and come out of a ghostly chariot uh, pulled by four ghostly horses and run into the house and look for look for some buried treasure, which will get him out of his financial problems. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's treasure and there's some papers. There's, there's a story oh, yeah, that papers. he left some papers behind uh, here that he is still looking for. Mr. Bond, can you talk a little bit about the Warren Hastings type ghosts, which are described in here as the Firangi boots, the ones who were the ghosts of English men and women who stayed back in India for eternity, so to speak. Well, um, um, I guess British ghosts are a little different from uh, homebred Indian ghosts, uh, and uh, they usually seem to haunt um, the cities where they lived, or hill stations in particular. And um, it's almost a tradition that a hill station should have a ghost, or an old building, uh, or a ruined church. Um, and, and in England, of course, um, it, you, I think you get a discount in some hotels if, if you say you if you've seen the, the the local ghost in 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 some former mansion which has been converted into do you, have a, to, do you have to prove it in order to get the discount or can you just say in the morning you have to show I saw the ghost plasm. last night can i get I my you have to give a pretty cut. convincing <laughs> but so kolkata well i noticed on on the victoria memorial you have those interesting bas reliefs and sculptures which were done by Lockwood Kipling, that's Rudyard Kipling's father. Um, he was a sculptor as well as an artist. And if any ghost comes around the Victoria Memorial, I should think he would be entitled to, to come and look at his work because a lot of people have forgotten it. Uh, he did these uh, interesting bas reliefs of sort of characters representing different communities in India. And you get them at the Victoria Memorial and even the Crawford Market in Bombay. Um, and, and they're worth sort of not just preserving, but uh, looking into more because Kipling's father was an interesting man, certainly more interesting than Rudyard Kipling himself, because he delved into the folklore of, 
of India, just as Rakesh has done. Mm. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, Francis Garnett Orme, who I think is one of the ghosts that you've written a lot about at the Savoy Hotel ghost. Yes. Well, that was a, a real case. It was a murder yeah, case. Yeah, yeah. Can you back. tell us that story at the Savoy Hotel? And then, actually, there's no evidence that her ghost actually appears. Mm. Um, people like to think that there is a ghost where there's been a, a violent murder or mm. um, something terrible has happened. But um, this particular incident or murder took place in 19... 12, I think, yeah, the, the year the Titanic went down. And um, it made the press in England too, because um, she, the victim was from a well-known family, uh, and she was a bit into uh, um, spiritualism and looking into crystal balls. This was in fashion then, at the time of Madame Blavatsky and, uh, you know, and Mr. Jacobs and similar. So, a lot of a lot of that went on, and um, so the, the case was well publicized, and it was interesting. And it was just my theory later that Agatha Christie might have read about it because in her very first novel, the plot the plot parallels uh, the incidents uh, uh, of this particular case. Uh, the the poison being introduced into a bottle of cough mixture and going to the bottom of the bottle so that it was only consumed after three or four days when the actual culprit or villain was out of the town and had a good alibi. Um, so, and, and, and got away with the murder, but, not, but didn't get away with the spoils because um, the family came out and contested the will uh, of the of the lady who'd been killed and because she'd left all her money to this um, uh, other person. So it was a sort of cause celebre at the time. But as for their ghosts appearing, um, that's, we we sometimes just bring ghosts into existence where they never uh, existed at all, simply to add a little more masala <laughs> to, the, to the facts. Mm. Which actually leads me to this question. I mean, the kind of ghosts that we're used to, that many of us think, when you hear about the word ghost, you think of this white, spooky, spectral creature floating yes. around a place like Victoria Memorial. But Rakesh, when you, do it, when you did this research, uh, is that white floating type ghost pretty much a British import like cricket? Are our local indigenous homegrown ghosts, beasts and monsters a little different? Yeah, I think they are. I think that uh, that idea of the wispy transparent thing is uh, British or at least European. And I think Blavatsky was one of the people who really brought it here. I think a lot of that idea of the ghost comes from the theosophists and the spiritualists who are trying to do seances and uh, and contact these dead. But the folkloric ghosts uh, of older Indian tradition tend to be solid. Uh, you can touch them and they can pick things up and they can eat. Mm. Um, they can also turn into a kind of a purplish smog and, and fit into a bottle. That also happens quite commonly. But, uh, but purplish. Gray, purple, gray, purple, purple smog is Mr. very Mr. Bond is wearing a purple sweater, I would just oh, point yes, out yes, right I, now. I will tell you about my purple sweater. You, well, you see, when I was a very small boy, my ayah used to tell me never to yawn or open my mouth under a people tree because the ghost in the people tree would jump down my throat and, and ruin my digestion forever. So I was very careful not to do that. And I was also told that... Um, the, the safer trees, a, a tree that never had a ghost was a jamun tree. And jamuns, of course, are purple. And I'm very fond of jamuns. And for various reasons, purple is my favorite color. So I think I wear purple partly because I like purple and partly because it keeps the spirits away. <laughs> um, so if you don't so what, want to... So grow, grow yeah. a jamun tree if you don't want too many ghosts around you. If you... <laughs> so if you learn nothing else today, remember, grow a jamun tree if you want to keep I had so not right. heard that one, actually. I've heard about ca uh, carrying iron, carrying some mustard seed. These are important things for keeping ghosts away. I, I didn't know about the jamun tree. The people tree, of course, is, 
because it's very old, I think, right? It's uh, uh, people so trees I'm can get to be like a thousand, two thousand years old. Also, you can't control a people tree. I mean, it'll grow out of your roof if you drop a seed there. No? There's yeah, they're so prolific and uh, um, and and of course, I guess uh, there's a particular type of ghost that they lives in a people tree. You know, a a prate or a a mischievous ghost who's in, uh, inclined to play tricks on you. Or on, or which, on any, anyone. Which I, I, Mr. Bond, I was going to ask Rakesh that. I mean, so are like the go you have I some three, there are some 322 entries for ghost monsters in this book. Mm -hmm. And if you take the subcategories, it comes, it crosses 700. But would you say that uh, are the bulks of them what we would call evil spirits or are they more mischievous type of creatures? There's a lot of crossover. I think there's there's a lot of uh, entities that are not really evil unless you do something to anger them, like mess with their tree or uh, um, go out at the wrong time of day into their area. Um, and it's different in different stories. Also, there's a, like um, there's a ghost called the Munjia, which is the ghost of someone, um, a bachelor, but uh, someone after they've tied the tied the uh, the sacred thread. And I think, uh, Mr. Bond, you've anthologized a few stories by the C.A. Kincaid, yeah? This yes. British writer who, oh, he's, right. he's yeah. got a great, he's got a great story about the Munjia. So his yeah. Munjia is very evil. Yes. But in many uh, other stories, uh, there are more mischievous and fun Munjias. And he'd who, have who ghosts, like uh, people turning into, into animals. Uh, you, you know, yes, he's got a great, uh, some great were hyena stories. What about vampires? Now, you see, I'm not scared of ghosts, but uh, I've I've always been scared of the thought of somebody, a man or a woman, digging his teeth into my neck to draw blood. You know, vampires scare me. Uh, but the tradition of the vampire, I don't know in India, Rakesh, if if it's uh, if it's very strong or not. Do, do we do we have vampires, hmm? or is that a European? They're, yeah, they're different. Uh, there's a thing in Tamil Nadu called the Kateri. And mm. uh, most people in Tamil Nadu will translate vampire to Kateri. But yeah. the Kateri is pretty different. First of all, they're jet black rather than being pale. They're mm. completely black. And uh, the Kateri, there's a Kate, it's an interesting story. There's a Kateri Aman who is a goddess from the Nilgiris. And uh, that goddess is supposed to be um, a form of Parvati who got a taste for eating dead bodies. Oh. And uh, she was caught in the act of sneaking off to the cremation ground to eat the dead bodies by Shiva. And so she promised that she would never do it again. And she slewed off her, uh, her cannibalistic form. And that form is Kateri Aman. And uh, so it's either Kateri Aman herself who is the Kateri, or it's like disciples of Kateri Aman who are the Kateris. And uh, they have to get... Uh, the skull of a firstborn son, and they mix up some very evil juice in the skull, and they'll put it here as a potu on their forehead, which gives them tremendous power. But if you want to defeat a katari, you just have to wipe this off. So, oh, that's easy. But but it also leads to an interesting question where sociologically, when you look at some of these, what do you think these mean? I mean, are, th are these examples of older, perhaps pre-Hindu traditions that are now being mainstreamed into the Hindu religions, older gods that have now, that are turned into monsters in order to accommodate into the larger pantheon or things like uh, inter-caste relationships or same-sex relationships, which were sort of taboo. So you kind of create ghosts and monsters out of them. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, what, what, uh, one explanation for a lot of the ghosts is they're sort of a personification of diseases. Uh, from before you understood a germ theory of, of, of disease, you know, somebody would take on a certain greenish tint and start vomiting blood, like, okay, that's, this demon has got you. They didn't know the names for malaria or typhoid or any of those oh, things. But and the, then there's, I guess, also sort of names for psychological ailments mm -hmm. that would be personas, personified as demons. And mm -hmm. then things that maybe, you know, now we are in our enlightened age don't perceive as ailments anymore, but uh, things things that uh, people would have thought were different or not understood or, um, they, you know, there could have been personifications of those. Yes, and, rural, uh, India, but, rural India, yes, uh, with, would have 
countless, countless ghosts, uh, as as uh, Rakesh no doubt has enumerated them. Hmm? Yeah, and um, com compared to the to the West or Europe, where it's rather you're limited to um, to a revenant or you know the, the the ghost of of someone who's just who's passed away and wants to return to the place where he or she um, had some uncompleted work. It seems to be more or less the 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 a, a typecast ghost, huh? a very literary right. ghost, you see. And in a way, and so when I write. Over the years, I've written the odd ghost story. They've been, in a way, literary ghosts. You see, I grew up on reading M. R. James and Elgin and Blackwood and and many of the great ghost story writers, and I wanted to write stories like them. So I just invented ghosts. I'm not I'm not in the habit of meeting them. <laughs> um, only once have I had a scary experience, uh, but. Uh, I might tell you about that. Tell day. us about it. <laughs> tell, no, tell us about you it. Might have to we, tell we, we can't leave it hanging. <laughs> I can't leave it hanging. Well, it's not so long ago. And at about two in the morning, I heard someone knocking on the front door. And um, I got up and I went to the door. And it's a glass door, so I could see through the glass. Um, but I opened it partially. And there was this woman standing there about 10 feet tall, all dressed in black. And she put out a hand and wanted to draw me out of the door. And I backed away and wrenched myself away and banged the door closed. Uh, and I went, then I ran back to my bedroom and got into bed. And then I heard some tapping on the window. And I got up again and looked and there was this monster out there, but I shouted two, three times, and she went away. And I'm still not sure if it this was a nightmare or if it really happened. It seemed so vivid that I feel it happened, but it might have been a nightmare. So we leave it at that. <laughs> well, there are, I mean, people here being from this part always know of the Nishi, which is a ghost that comes and calls and calls you. And yeah. you say you, you you don't answer the and they sometimes take on the voice of someone you know mm. when they call you and that's why you're supposed to make them call three times because if you don't answer three times the nishi is supposed to go away. But the mm. book is actually full of a lot of these um, strange apparitions that show up in the middle of the night and maybe you could tell us Rakesh. I I remember um, in the south in Karnataka I think there's the Hemalati. And there's one in Kerala, which are beautiful women whom uh, you find on the highway and offering you betel nuts. Can you tell us about oh. them? Right. So, uh, yeah, there's a few traditions. One is from Kasaragod in, in Kerala and another from uh, the Kumbri Marathi in Karnataka. So, yeah. Ote Malachi or Himalati, which I, I think means one breast. And uh, so, this is a, a, a beautiful woman who will come up to you in the forest and ask you for some betel nut. And... Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically uh, the betel nut will get dropped. Mm. And uh, as you bend down to pick up the betel nut, she'll take out her single large breast from, from her blouse and womp you on the head with it. Um, <laughs> at, 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 smack. <laughs> <laughs> at which point you will be stricken with a very high fever and run home in terror and die within three days without spiritual in intervention. So oh, that's uh, a good yeah. one, yes. I must remember that and put it into one of my stories. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which which makes me think, what do you think might have been the source of a story like this? I mean, what were people, other than warning you not to accept betel nut from yeah. a woman well, in the middle of the night on a highway, what yeah. else could they have been warning us against? But And also, we have one like that up here in, in Missouri. She's known as a Bhut Auntie, Auntie Ghost. And uh, she, you, if you're driving up from Dehradun, you'll you'll see her sitting on the wall on the parapet, all dressed in white, and she wants a lift. She tries to stop you and ask you for a lift. And, but if you do give her a lift and get into the car, you're bound to have an accident, hmm? and it's often a fatal one. So if you, it's it's similar to that. So in other words, don't pick up strange ladies on the on the road or. Um, be careful. As who long as they're white. If, if they're wearing colored dress, it's okay. 
We have wide breasts or single breast, uh, single breasted ladies offering you betel nut on the middle of the road are best avoided. Now, your ghost, uh, Mr. Bond, got recently translated into on screen in a web series. Mm. And it made me wonder as a writer, do you, what did you think? Are ghosts better seen or better imagined? Because when you are reading them in a book. Yes, I think better imagined or better read. But you see, I, I only recently saw one or two of those films. They had blown them up a bit because they were based on very short stories. In one or two cases, the, the stories were just two or three pages. Um, so when you f fill them out like that, and um, in order to make turn them into a 20-minute or half an hour film, a lot of extraneous matters put in, and it's inclined to drag and and lose its effect. Um, so it's, I think, very difficult to tell a ghost story on film um, because a film is usually two or three hours, you know, and the best ghost stories are are short. Um, I, so looking back over the years, films that were based on ghost stories, not many that were really... I mean, I wouldn't count horror films, you know, uh, as ghost stories that um, Frankenstein and and others, um, you know, those are monsters, of course, which are part of your conversation. But um, um, actually, a good ghost story was The Turn of the Screw by uh, Henry M James. Henry James. And that made a good film, I remember, because it because it went there into the. Uh, into the characters of the uh, people con connected with it. Um, Actually, I re that reminded me, I mean, many people here might have seen, uh, Aparna Sen here made a very beloved ghost story, uh, Goinar Baksho, uh, into a film called Jewelry Box, where Moshumi Chatterjee plays this old aunt who becomes a ghost and then hangs around for three generations, mm -hmm. basically giving advice, causing trouble. And she's a pretty feisty ghost that shows up, which uh, brings us to the obvious thing, Rakesh, since we are here in Bengal, um, we've grown up, most of us know of ghosts, uh, Gecho Bhut, Mecho Bhut, fish eating ghosts, tree living ghosts, Besho Bhut, uh, bamboo tree ghosts. What do you think our ghosts tell us about the area we live in? <laughs> you like to eat fish? <laughs> <laughs> that we like to eat fish, yes. Um, yeah, I don't know, there's a, uh... I guess um, there, there's that classic book uh, by Lal Bihari Dei, yeah, that folk tales of Bengal, where I think uh, I think it's from 1883 or something, where I think a lot of these uh, a lot of these very uh, uh, Bengali ghosts are, are first came to the notice of English readers, um, in, including the Shang uh, uh and many aspects of uh, uh, the Brahma I don't know how you say that in Bengali. Yeah. Which also means that, I mean, you grew up in America, I did, right? Yeah. And, and I think one of the things you realize as you read this book is that in India, because of our history and our geography, the, there's actually a stunning diversity of ghosts. Every, yes. like it, a ghost in, 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 a ghost in London is not necessarily that different from a ghost in Birmingham or for that matter, a ghost in Paris. They are all very similar ghosts. You know, at the most, you might have the vampires of Transylvania or something, but the ghosts don't vary that much. But here in one place like India, there's a staggering diversity of ghosts, which is affected by and the habits of the region, right? So from Bengal, the ghosts naturally eat fish. Yeah, and especially, I mean, I think there's necrodiversity hotspots in the country. Like the Northeast, just as it is like for languages, there are so many different uh, ghosts and all the different folklores of Mizoram and Manipur. And each tribe you go to in the Northeast has its own pantheon of monsters and ghosts. And that was one of the, one of the things that was most fun about researching the book. Yeah. How many ghosts did you think you'd find when you were... <laughs> starting out on this book. I mean, did you think it would be a book that is sort of this thick? I mean, I do think it's infinite in a way, right? Because every every grandmother will tell the story differently, right? So like, uh, there's there's infinite variety. But um, I mean, I was inspired to do this because we worked on two books of folklore, one by Ki Rajanarayanan from Tamil Nadu and one by Cherry Changte from Mizoram. And both uh, Cherry Changte's book especially kind of uh, concentrates on 
supernatural romance. So she's really interested when the ghost or the monster and the human have a love affair. Um, sometimes consensual and sometimes not. But uh, So those were really interesting to me. And they were so different from the stories that came from the South that I was like, let's try to collect from everywhere. Yeah. Well, since you brought up this affair, does that surprise you, Mr. Bond? There's actually a lot of ghost humans. I know there are children here, yes. but still, uh, it is a daytime session. But uh, there is a lot of ghost human SEX happening in this in this book. And uh, does that surprise you that uh, Indian ghosts are not very prudish? Uh, that yes, that's true. It, it, actually, it's a wonderful uh, field for a ghost. A writer of ghost stories. You don't. You can't run out of material in India because of the immense variety of of spooks and and uh, the, the 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 different ways in which they operate. Um, so and as, and I think it's partly uh, I think because of the richness of our our, our yeah. the religion here. Or, or you know Hinduism is is, is populated with. Spirits and folklore and ghosts and 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 um, and even other religions, sort of like Christianity, over the years has picked up uh, picked up some of the um, the the beliefs from Hinduism and and other you know religions that have always been here. So it's it it is a uh, you know a, a tremendous. Uh, um, I'm very grateful. I, I I can never run out of whenever I'm on a blank and what am I going to write next? And if I don't have any ideas, I'll do a ghost story <laughs> because um, because the possibilities are almost endless, you know. And after all, you could a ghost can do practically anything it wants. Eh? So <laughs> you, right, you, right, you, human you, beings you are rather rest from restricted it. by their normal and natural behavior, whereas um, you're not restricted with a ghost, actually, because they're not restricted. But speaking of, uh, so do, have your ghosts ever had sex? Sex? Um, I, I think, no, it's, oddly enough, ghosts, partly because the, I suppose ghosts which were popular in English literature were very Victorian. So I right. mean, even... Or even normal people didn't have sex in in in, in Victorian <laughs> novels, so um, the, so the ghosts wouldn't have had it either. But I should think Indian ghosts have a great time too. I mean, uh, you know, nobody. Yeah, going. Indian ghosts are just multiplying <laughs> like Indians. They don't, they don't restrain themselves. <laughs> hmm. and are they happy ghost human love stories, or do they usually come to a bad end? Uh, most of the ones that are called ghosts seem to come to a bad end. There's like uh, other supernatural entities that are not considered ghosts where they're they're nice sort of like in, in Mizoram, they're called lassi. They're sort of like elves or hidden folk. There's lots of half lassi who have become great heroes and well-known people. But the ghost relationship seems to gen seem to generally turn out badly. I'm thinking of uh, Runia, Runia from Kumaon, who's a, he's interesting. He's personified as a boulder. He's like a landslide god and you'll come tumbling down the road like a rolling stone. Um, but uh, in Kumaon, like the, the, I think it happens all over India, this ritual of stealing the groom's shoes. Uh, right, right. But in, in Kumaon, you steal the groom's shoes because if you don't, Runia will sneak into the souls and go into the bridal chamber and push the groom aside. So, uh, and, and you should tell the audience, um, in these ghost human romance, I'm going to get off the sex topic in a minute, but uh, while we're on it, in these ghost human relationships, uh, it's bo it goes both, I, I mean, it's both female ghosts who are attracted to human males as well as male ghosts who try to get females. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's not always completely hetero also. <laughs> um, but uh, there's uh, Mohini Pasasu is a very well-known one in, in, in the south of India. Um, uh, Mohini Pe in Tamil Nadu or, or um, Mohini, Mohini Pasasu in Kerala or the Yakshi, the Vara Yakshi, uh, which are very similar. Um, Jasmine in the hair, again, white dress, um, turns into a big mouth with fangs and eats you once you get once she gets you inside I, I there's one ghost i'm really interested in because he's that ghost is really attracted to uh 
men with receding hairlines. So that <laughs> I think there is hope for us all when it comes to like, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool that there are ghosts that are so, you know, that not the, bound uh, by body shaming. And they get a good that. view of your your head from the from the people tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, is your head really? Sh oh, that's a nice shiny head. And I'm like, the ghost is extremely excited by it. That's the uh, Rantas from from Kashmir. Yeah, Rantas from yeah, Kashmir. Yeah, yeah. So next time she we, likes she likes strong bodies. I'll, but, I'll, but work, I'll go to the gym uh, uh, for a couple of months <laughs> before I go to Kashmir. I don't have to worry about the hair, but. Uh, but that one also, it doesn't come to a good end, right? Yeah, no, not really. She'll she'll take you to her cave and tie you up and kind of use you for a while. If, you can get away from her if you tie her hair to a pillar. That's to a, a pillow? Yeah, if you tie her hair to a pillar, she won't be able to get loose. Uh -huh. Which well, actually leads to a very important point. How do you get away from ghosts, monsters, and demons? And uh, Mr. Bond, in your books, um, what are some of the strategies you use to actually get away from the ghosts when you're done with them? They don't often get away from them, actually. I guess, in my case, of course, it's the purple Sometimes spider. your ghosts run away. <laughs> hmm? Yes. Uh, I, um, let's, they, sometimes it's, it's, they continue to pursue you, even when you think you've, uh, uh, You've got away or done away with, uh, with them. Ghosts, are, I suppose, can be very persistent. They go on until they drive you crazy, or until you, you know, jumped off a bridge and <laughs> and and join them in a way. I think they often want you to join them. Um, so they vary a lot. One thing I've noticed: we've talked about different parts of India, and the, it's it it's very much it in Bengal that the ghost story is still such a popular genre of fiction. Um, not so much in, in North India. I mean, people tell ghost stories still, but they don't write them that much. But it's as a literary um, as, as a literary genre, the, the ghost story seems to be um, in a very healthy condition in, in Bengal, in, in Bengali. I want to open this up to a couple of questions from the audience. But while we do that, you know, we talked about this huge diversity of ghosts in the country, ghosts and monsters. And since India has a, you know, we have a national song, a national bird, a national animal. <laughs> and this is a question for both of you. If, there, if we had to have a national ghost, what might that be? The national Rakesh, ghost. Do you have a, a, I'm a, have a to, candidate? I'm going to have to think about that for a minute. Yeah, think about it. And um, Mr. Bond also think about a national national ghost. And actually, in the audience, you're welcome to uh, chime in with your candidates. But any questions for Rakesh or Mr. Bond? Uh, we have a mic. Um, my question is to Mr. Bond. First of all, sir, a huge fan since childhood. So one of my favorite ghost stories of yours is the face in the dark, a faceless, featureless ghost. So yeah. I wanted to ask yeah. what inspired you to write that? Well, Partly, it's a part part folk tale, uh, which I elaborated, um, and which I'm still elaborating because I've had complaints that it it ends very inconclusively. Uh, so I'm going to add add on a bit and uh, turn him into a into a digital ghost, you know, and bring him really up to date. Uh, so it, it's 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 it, it's partly imaginative, partly folklore, and. Um, which I sort of changed around. Hmm. Uh, very short, it's just a um, page and a half, which is why I say um, it, not something that should someone should attempt to film because it would lose its effect. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad you like that that story. Hmm. Um, it's it's one that seems to have survived over the years, hmm. like a good ghost. It it, it it's still going around. Hmm. And um, I, I think a lot of young people ask me questions about it because it it was recently in in their in their course in their um, ICSC. Uh, or, or we something. have a ghost in the connection, but uh, there's a question up in front here. Yes. So oh. we would have a ghost that would magic and. That would do all the things small, 
with or, people and things. Or they would make them small. Oh, oh lovely. Oh, little magic. Yes. That's the word, you see. That's what ghosts are all about. Yeah? Magic. <laughs> I've heard more about ghosts that can make themselves small or really big, like change <laughs> size. But this one was making other other people small. Is that right? Yes. You are quite small. <laughs> are you sh- you haven't on your way to this venue, have you? No, it's okay. You are you are you are not you haven't been shrunk by a ghost. You didn't meet any ghosts. No. Oh good, good, good. <laughs> Just checking. There's a question in the back there. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Hi, so uh, when, we, when we talk about the Upanishads, uh, in one of the Upanishads uh, called the Mandukya Upanishad, uh, we talk about consciousness, subconsciousness, and the unconscious state of human mind. But apart from that, we also talk about Turiya, the fourth state, which is the super consciousness. So what do you think uh, is the relation between the super consciousness and a ghost or a soul or a demon might, I mean, like if we have a correlation in that respect? Either of you want to jump in? We may outsource this question to the next delegate, Amish Tripathi, who also knows a few things about Uh. these. (laughs) No, I was going to outsource the question to you in case my panelists didn't manage to. (laughs) But do you have any thoughts to add? I I was leaving the answer to Rakesh. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My research was more into the folkloric side of things and not so much into the the big tradition of uh, of Sanskrit texts and Upanishads and all. Um, But I think, you know, I think there is, yeah, there's in many, many traditions, there's a meditative plane, right, where 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 you can meet things either in dreams or in some kind of meditative state. A lot of these a lot of these stories happen there. These travels to other lands, travels to the lands of the hidden folk. yeah, it's it's a different state of consciousness. Let's sure. take one last question. Is there any question from this side? I feel like I've ignored you. So there's this lady in the back. If you could get give her the mic. Actually, we'll take these two. Why don't you ask your question? Keep it brief, and you ask the question too, and we'll take the answers together. So, having grown up in a hill station, you must have been in a company of many haunted houses and dark bungalows of the sort. So, would you like to share with us if you've explored any or any that has a great history to it or something okay and uh so any dark bungalow history and you well give the bike to you there's the young woman at the back uh in a general view everyone just gets scared of the term ghost so what's your take on this i mean like ghost or other niche like vampires or demons really reflect just a negative perspectives? Uh, very good question to end on. But uh, let me first ask you, Mr. Bond, quickly, are there uh, the question about d- dark bungalows and uh, whether you've explored any yes, ghostly that's ones? That's sort of become traditional, the dark bungalow. I think you even have a an online magazine called for ghost stories called hmm, um, Dark Bungalow. Uh, but um, so I guess that goes back again to early British times when the these dark bungalows, they were very often situated in lonely places where the travelers or where the, 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 actually the postal system used them. Um, and they sort of acquired a reputation for being haunted, again, partly from stories written by Kipling and others like him or Alice Perrin. So it, it, it's a, I don't think dark bungalow is any more haunted than any other building. Um, and they just, I, they just have the reputation. They're just a reputation. Okay. Yeah, I would say. Um, we are actually out of time. So I'll let you have the last word on the woman's question about the negative connotation. Well, I, I was just, it made me think of another big class of spirits that uh, I found in the book, which are like uh, pets or ghosts that are kept... Uh, to run errands for you or do mischief for you. Uh, so there's lots of those all over the country. You have Kuti Chatan, which some people might know from the movie, My Dear Kuti Chatan. Um, or in many traditions, there's uh, there's small ghosts that you can kind of keep in a little jar and a feed them coconuts sometimes. That will run errands. That's perfect. That's all not of so us negative. Needs, 
need a pet ghost. And I think at the end, because it's a lit fest, I just wanted to mention one ghost I thought would be particularly good for a lit fest, which is in this book. And it's called the printer's devil. And in Bengali, it's called the Chapa Khanar Bhut, which is it. So I think that's a perfect... We still didn't get our answer to the national ghost, but uh, we'll all think about that. And meanwhile, thank you so much, all of you, for coming out in the noonday sun to talk about ghosts. And thank you, Mr. Bond, for joining Thanks us. So and thank you, Rakesh, for your book. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Rakesh. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to thank our speakers for this wonderful session. Can we have another round of applause for them? Uh, we move on to our next session, the Shiva Trilogy, a decade later. Amish looks back at his trailblazing start to writing in conversation with Siddharth Pansari. Uh, quickly introducing the speakers. Okay. Amish is an author, columnist. I'm scratching too much, but you can't see me scratching. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rakesh will be signing his books at the bookstore. So if you want to get your copy signed, you can uh, meet him at the bookstore. Um, coming back, Amish is an author, columnist, and diplomat described as India's Tolkien by BBC. Amish's unique combination of crackling storytelling, religious, uh, religious symbolism, and profound philosophies has turned him into an Indian publishing phenomenon. His Shiva trilogy is the fastest-selling book series.